one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. This concept has been prevalent in our culture, not only in the past couple of weeks, but longer than we probably think that one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. Now, because we don't have the capacity to individually assess the heart of every single person, like I don't have the capacity to individually assess every single police officer's intent. I don't have the capacity to individually assess every protester's motive for protesting or even the motive of the entire protest. I don't have the capacity to individually assess every governor or the president and their heart and their motive for shutting down things, stay-at-home orders, or even reopening different parts of our society. Because we can't individually assess the intent of every single person's heart, what we do is this, is that we tend to assume the best in people that we know, people that we're close with, people that we feel a connection to, and we assume not, assume not the best in those that we don't really know, that aren't like us, that we don't have that connection with. And what happens is we allow this concept of one bad apple to spoil the whole bunch permeate into our hearts. That's not really something that we want to have as followers of Jesus. And you may be thinking to yourself, like I was this past week, as I was even reflecting on this, that, that you would say, no, no, no I, I don't do that. I, I, would never, I would never do that. But think back in these last couple of weeks over comments that you may have thought or said or even posted on your social media platform uh, certain comments that revealed this about you, that you would assume the best in people that you can connect with or enjoy being around or, or whoever it is. You may have said the phrases like, well, not all cops are bad. Well, not all protests turn into riots or looting. Not all government officials have their own interest in mind. Not all white people are racist. You see, if you've made a comment or thought something like that, what it shows is that you are assuming the best in that group of people or person that you're connected to. And we don't necessarily do this for everyone. Now, as a follower of Jesus, it's so important that we don't have this type of thinking because in the family of God, we don't want that reputation or that perception about our family. And unfortunately, there have been some bad apples that have used the name of Jesus in our country's history for not so good things, for things that don't represent the family of God. In the 1800s, people who claimed to follow Jesus used the Bible itself to say it was okay to have slaves and to treat African Americans as nothing short of being created in the image of God. In the 1900s, Christians use scriptures, Christians use their thought process in the name of Jesus to say it was okay to have segregated parts of our society for blacks and for whites. And taking a step away from social injustices, in the early 2000s, the perception of evangelical Christianity for some in America was perceived through the lens of looking at one specific church, Westboro Baptist Church, a hate-filled church church that was not representing the family of God the way you and I would want the family of God represented, the way you and I believe what God has to say about how we should live our lives. You see, as followers of Jesus, we don't want this idea of one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch on us. So then we have to work hard at getting that out of our own hearts, especially during this time. So my question for us this morning is this, how do we do that? How do I make that change individually in my own heart? And how do we work hard against the idea that other people may perceive the family of God is not in a way that's positive because of some bad apples? The answer to that question, relationships. It's relationships. This morning, as we continue on in our No Ordinary Family series, we're going to be looking at one of the most profound truths in all of the Bible and in all of life that I believe will help us to continue 
to be the church, the local church that God has called CCCH to be here in our community. You know, over these past few weeks, some of you have been asking me, whether it's text or email or over social media, hey, why are we using this sermon graphic for this sermon series? It's kind of raised a flag or brought a level of awareness and questioning in your own heart as to why would we use a predominantly white family in this sermon graphic? It's a great question. And I'm so glad that you're asking that question. And the answer is that there's intentionality as to why I and others made that decision to do that. And next week, the plan had been all along to have a conversation about some of these things, about diversity and the pursuit of social justice within the family of God. Now, when we planned this sermon series a few weeks ago, or I'm sorry, a few months ago, we had no idea that the entire world would be talking about social justices and diversity. No idea. And so we're going to get to it next week. And so just be ready to come back next week as we talk more about that in our family of God context. So we'll get back to that. But this morning, what I want us to do is this, is to, to shift our focuses on the local church. And when we started this series, I said, we're going to spend a couple weeks talking about the global church, the global family of God. And then for the last two weeks, we'll focus on the local church, the local family of God. And so today we, we talk about us. We talk about CCCH and what God desires for us as his sons and his daughters. And so if you have a Bible, go ahead and right now and turn to the book of Jude. We're going to start in verse 16 in just a moment. Verses are going to appear on the screen throughout the morning as well. Now, as you're turning there, I, I want us to just have in our minds what our big idea for this morning is. If there's one thing that you can take away from this message this morning, it's this. If you're taking notes at home, write this down. You can take a screenshot of this image. Here it is. Relationships unify the people and clarify the mission of God's family. Relationships unify the people and clarify the mission of God's family. As this local family, we're going to see that relationships not only keep us together, but our relationships with each other help us to have positive relationships with others out in our community. So let's dive in, starting in verse 16 of the book of Jude, picking up, picking up a little bit to what we talked about last week. This is what Jude writes. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and they flatter others for their own advantage. So this last verse, verse 16, summarizes this long section that we talked about last week in which Jude calls out the teachers and the leaders within this church that he wrote to 2,000 years ago whose actions didn't line up with what they said was in their heart. Their their actions didn't reveal that they were following Jesus, but it revealed that they were putting themselves in charge and doing whatever they wanted to do. And because of that, it was becoming destructive for this church family. And to summarize all of that, like we talked about last week, he says that these people are grumblers and fault finders. And they're not grumbling against other people in the church. They're not pointing out the faults of other people in the church. This grumbling and fault finding is actually directed at God. The language there would resonate with the Jewish believers who would think back to the times when their ancestors were led out of Egyptian slavery and into the promised land. And many of them didn't like God's plan of what he had for them. Many of them were fearful and scared. And so what did they do? They grumbled against God and they said, God, why'd you lead us out here? We were better as slaves back in Egypt. How could you do this to us? And then they were fault finders. They pointed the finger at God and said, God, it's your fault that we're suffering. God, it's your fault that we're going through this. So Jude says, what is going on is that as you see them grumble and find faults in God, it reveals their heart's desires, which are evil, which are selfish. And so what they are doing is that it reveals them their pride. It reveals their greed. Even in that church, what they were doing is only speaking to people who could financially bless them and support them. They were only teaching and leading people that they wanted to teach because of the financial implications that they would get from those people. And Jude says, that can't happen. But here's hope. 
Here's what you and I as followers today, here's what they did 2,000 years ago, could put their hope in despite all of the, the chaos and the struggles and the divisiveness and the selfishness that was happening in their church. Here it is, the hope that we find. Verse 17 says this, But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, In the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. So the hope is this, that God's not surprised by it. In fact, God, through the communication of human people long time ago, prophesied that this would happen. Even today, we see people who are leading churches that are divisive. And so our hope is that God's not surprised. Wait, that, that's it? <laughs> that's the hope? As, as we struggle, as we deal with everything going on, as, as we fight these divisions, what you're telling us, Jude, is that, well, God's not surprised. How, how is that hopeful? How is that encouraging for me today? Oh, God on his throne, he sees what's going on and he's not surprised by it. There's nothing new under the sun. One bad apple is not going to spoil the whole bunch. Oh, you're not surprised by it. Well, see, we, we find hope in that. Even though my natural instinct, and maybe your natural instinct is to say, how is that hopeful? Is because I don't have hope in myself to fix it. I don't have control of myself to, to fix it. But I do know that the foundation for change comes in trusting in God. The foundation for new life comes in believing that God does got it. That he is in control. He's not surprised by it. And we put our trust and our hope in him. Now, there are steps that God then asks, asks us to act on in our society, in our culture, in our church, to be a part of the change. But that can't be done on our own skill. That can't be done on our own passion. It has to first and foremost come directly from God. And so we start with putting our hope in God. And then Jude goes to verse 20 and 21, and he says, this is how you church can be a part of the change that can happen within your church family. So verse 20 says this, But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Now this is the third time in this letter that Jude has said, Dear friends, and like we talked about last week, anytime you read your Bible and something is repeated, it's an exclamation point. It's an all caps email. It's saying, hey, don't miss this important truth. And three different times he says, dear friends. Why? Because everything we, he talks about here can't be done just individually. It has to be done in the context of relationships. It has to be done by interacting with other people. And there's four different verbs here in verse 20 and 21. The, the building up, the praying, the keeping, and the waiting that Jude tells us to do. And what we realize is all four of these verbs, they are individual actions. But they, in order to make change, they have to be done together with others within the family of God. So this first verb, this idea of building yourselves up. When the Jewish audience would have heard this word, it would have taken them back to the time in their ancestors' history, where the people of God, in order to experience the presence of God and to worship God, had to literally build a temple. And this happened multiple times within their ancestors' history. And they had to build this temple in order to worship God, to be in his presence, to enjoy fellowship with other people who are following God. And they would reflect on the fact that these buildings were not just a, a crew that was hired as a part of Israel to make this happen. Mm -mm. This was an all-out effort from every single individual in Israel to be a part of building the temple of God. And so what Jude is saying here is that the building up of each other in our faith, it has to be everyone in it together. All hands on deck. Every person is needed. 
And even though they're not building a temple to be in the presence of God, what he's saying is that you can build into each other's faith by being in relationship with each other. So even though there's not a physical building to do this in, you can still encourage and build each other up together. I don't know if that's prophetic or not, but it's applicable to what we're going through today. Even though there's not a physical building that we're allowed to be in at this time together as a church family, we can still build each other up in the faith through relationship with each other. Now, I, I'm at the place too where I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to have people here. I'm ready to not just keep preaching to a camera, but they have this auditorium filled. I'm, I'm there. I, I want it too. But it's a good reminder for me this morning that you and I can encourage and build each other up and stay unified and be on mission when we decide that we're going to be unified on the things that are more, most important to God and his family. And then the other three verbs, we even get a glimpse as to what's very important. This other one, praying in the Holy Spirit. Meaning my prayers aren't selfish. Meaning those nudges and those thoughts that I think come out of left field could be thoughts from the Holy Spirit telling me this is who I should pray for. This is who I should reach out to. This is who I should call or text to see how they're doing. And then in verse 21, to keep yourself in God's love and then to wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keeping and waiting. It's something that we saw at the beginning of this letter, God does for us. He keeps us in his love. But now you and I, by encouraging and building into each other, we help each other stay connected to God's love. We persevere through difficult trials. We go through hard times together and that helps us to wait for the mercy and the grace that we'll experience someday forever in a relationship with Jesus. So you and I have to do this together and we wait through difficult times together. And the hope is that in eternity someday there won't be struggle, there won't be pain, there won't be suffering. And so we hold on to that hope together. If you're trying to do that on your own, you're going to feel isolated and discouraged. And it's going to be hard to keep your eyes up to God when you're trying to do it by yourself. But when you can do that with other people who are also part of this family, it helps. It helps us to move forward and doing what God has called us to do in our church. And so we have to stay unified in this together. Relationships will help us to stay unified in this together. But then the second part of that big idea, not only are we staying unified because of relationships, we're staying on mission because of relationships. And here's the mission that Jude gives to his people here in verse 22 and 23 that is so good for us this morning as a reminder for us. So verse 22 says this, be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy. Mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. So what Jude does here is he gives them three different groups of people that they need to be merciful to. Now that word mercy, we've defined it before. It's withholding punishment from someone who rightfully deserves it. It's not giving someone what they deserve. It's not lashing out or clapping back at someone for saying something that's mean or cruel on social media, instead refraining from going after them. That's just a practical, simple example of what mercy would be like in our culture, in our climate today. So the family characteristic of showing mercy to other people will overcome the bad reputation. That one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. Showing mercy to others and leading with mercy will eradicate that idea and that thought and that feeling in our heart where we assume the best only in the people that we know instead of assuming the best in everyone around us because they're all created in the image of God. So mercy is something that we experience from God and then we have an opportunity to show it to other people. And the three different types of uh, people that Jude tells them to show mercy to are found here. And all of them are within their family context. The first one here in verse 23 is the ones that you are merciful to. I'm sorry, in verse 22 are the ones that you're merciful to those who doubt. 
So you show mercy, Jude says, to the people who are being swayed or pulled away by the teachers and leaders of this church. They're unsure because they remember the things that were taught from the beginning about Jesus. They remember that their actions are supposed to back up what they believe. But they're going back and forth because what these people have to say sounds different. And they're not sure because some of them are leaders and the leaders are being divisive and they're not unified. And I don't know what to do. And so Jude says, instead of pointing them out, instead of yelling at them, instead of clapping back at them on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, you show mercy. You show compassion. You show kindness. And that's how you save them from their doubting. When they see you live a merciful life, they'll look to you and say, oh yeah, that's right. Actions are supposed to back up what you believe. Okay, I I do remember that now. I can see the difference between right and wrong. What's true and what's not true. The second group you're supposed to show mercy to, as he tells them in verse 23, is when you show mercy, you save others by snatching them from the fire. These are people who may have came into the family of God and they thought they were a part of the family of God because of hearing the teaching of these false teachers. And what Jude says is you don't judge these people who don't understand everything about the family of God yet. What you do is you show them mercy. Because as you show them mercy, you have an opportunity to snatch them from the internal judgment that all of us deserve because of our lack of faith in Jesus. It's not by pointing out all their faults. It's not by yelling at them. It's by saying, hey, let me show mercy to you. And that is how you'll save them. And then the last group of people, just others show mercy mixed with fear. He's talking specifically about the teachers and the leaders within that church who were promoting these false ideas of what it meant to be in the family of God. He says, you don't go up against them yelling and screaming at them. You don't try to start conflict with them every single time. You show them mercy. You love them like you love yourself. You love your enemy and you pray for those who persecute you. It's in those acts of mercy that Jude says, God's not done with them yet. Even if they've lived this corrupt, selfish lifestyle to this point, even if they've led people astray, God's not done with them yet. And so you show them mercy. And just remember, church, all of this is happening in the context of a relationship. You can't show mercy without another person being on the receiving end of that mercy. And for you and I, in the cultural climate that we're in today, we as a church should be known for our mercy, our compassion, our kindness, and our care. But to be honest, that has to start with our church family, with our local church. You know, over the past few weeks and months, as we've talked about what it looks like to reopen on a Sunday morning and gather in person, I've gotten lots of emails and feedback and comments and text messages and and even from the church survey a couple weeks ago. We're not all on the same page as to when and how that should look like. And so through all these decisions, we can stay united on the fact that we want to gather together because we love being in the presence of God and the presence with each other. So we stay unified in that and then we show mercy to others even if we don't agree or see eye to eye on certain things. Even after my sermon from this past week, this past Sunday, some of my own personal social media posts speaking out against social injustices and systemic racism in our culture, even from our prayer night this past Wednesday night or our worship and prayer night this Wednesday night where we're going to have Alvin Bibbs from JJA join us. Our church is united in the fact, from all the feedback that I've gotten, that we want to have justice for all. We believe that being a follower of Jesus means that we care about justice because we care about the things that Jesus cares about and stood for. But the steps forward, we're not all unified yet. And that's okay. Because we can have conversations with each other. And in those conversations, we can assume the best that we all want this moving forward. And we can show mercy to each other as we have these conversations. But church, this can't happen We can't be unified. We can't move forward unless we're in relationship with each other. And that's why I'm so excited here in in a couple weeks, we're going to launch a life group push. We're going to go full force with life groups this summer. 
Usually we don't do that, but this year we're going after it. Everyone's still kind of at home. Everyone's moving around. But now that everyone's online and on Zoom, you can even do online life groups and you can connect with other people. So excited that many of our groups are going to be connecting with our sermon series throughout the summer, The Real God, as we look at the heart of God and how that translates into how our hearts should be. And it's in these conversations, in these life groups that will happen over the, the summer that a lot of these things are going to come up. These issues are going to come up. And what we need to do here for our own family is to assume the best, is to believe the best in each other. And then even if we don't see eye to eye in some other things, we show mercy and compassion and care to each other. And so my challenge for you this summer, over these next couple weeks, go to our website. Go to the Connect tab. You'll see where it says Life Groups. Click there and you can sign up for our Life Group today. You can also, there's a list of all the Life Groups that are open this summer. And you, you may be thinking to yourself right now, well, you know what? I need to start a conversation about this. I need to have connection with other people. I want to lead a group as well. Well, if you can do that, great. You can email our life groups director, Ann Ogilvie. Her email's there on the slide or on the, the video. She'd love to connect with you and talk about that as well. You see, church, we have to move forward in showing mercy to each other. We have to move forward in staying unified and on mission. And we can only do that in the context of relationship. I want to end our time together by sharing a story from our Gather on the Grounds event this past Monday night. It was our first one. We had 10 people here with Pastor Amato out in the parking lot, and they had an opportunity just to talk and connect and hang out. And as anyone can sign up, there's another one tomorrow night if you want to sign up for that as well. And what was so encouraging is what took place that night. Pastor Amato was telling me this story that there were uh, mostly white people, himself, Hispanic, and a black lady from our church, all CCCH people. And one of the white people there just kind of paused for a moment after they had chit-chatted for 15, 20 minutes and just asked a question to the black person from our church and, and just said this, I don't know what to think about these protests and everything going on. I'm really struggling internally. I don't know how to process all these things. Can you just share with me how you're feeling? Can you just share your thoughts about these things? And what took place over the next 45 minutes was a beautiful conversation of our church living out what we just talked about this morning. Showing mercy and compassion, listening before speaking, wanting to hear someone else's perspective instead of feeling the need to, just to share your perspective first. It was awesome. Everyone left that conversation feeling edified and encouraged. And when Amato shared that with me this past week, I was just, I was so proud of that group of people. I was so proud of, of the, the person who asked the question and the, the person who answered the question as well. In church, that's what we need to do. Because when we do that with each other, what happens is, th is this. Is that even if there are bad apples out in, the, in our world that promote Christianity and the world looks at them, then they'll see how we're interacting with each other. And it'll change their perspective. It'll make them feel and think differently about Christians. It'll create in them the desire to want to be a part of the family of God because they see unity and they see purpose, something that our world is craving for today. And it's in our opportunities of being in a relationship with each other that we build relationships with those outside the family of God. And then we can introduce them to the hope of the world, to the light of the world. Jesus Christ, the only one who can make heart change in all of us. And so I want to end by doing this as our worship team comes out and leads us in communion taken together. I want to ask us this question. Here it is. What's, what do I need to do this summer to be in relationship with my family at CCCH. What do I need to do this summer to be in relationship with my CCCH family? During this time, as we reflect on communion, reflect on everything that Jesus did for us through his death and resurrection, can you begin to ask God that question? And out of today's message, my hope and encouragement is this. Whatever that action step is, whatever else God has laid on your heart, 
Maybe it's to be more merciful or empathetic or understanding or listening, whatever it is. Can you commit to yourself today and maybe to the people you're watching with that you're going to take that action step? What is one thing that I can do to get connected with my family here at CCCH?